Hello and welcome to this web lecture. We've now finished up our discussion of population genetics in terms of changes in allele frequencies that are due to the act of natural selection. Now we're going to start to turn our attention to the other factors that can cause changes in allele frequencies. So let's go back to this list of Hardy-Weinberg conditions. Remember, these are the five conditions that will cause allele frequencies not to change in a population. And that if we think of the converse of these, um, that gives us a complete list of all of the things that can cause changes in allele frequencies. So this first one on the list that I've highlighted is that the population is infinitely large. So if the population is not infinitely large, if we have relatively small population sizes in particular, then a factor called genetic drift can come into play. So what is genetic drift? If you are going to associate genetic drift as a concept with one particular word, that word should be random. It is the effects of anything that happens just completely at random to change allele frequencies. So this can cover um, any kind of accidental, random removal of individuals from the population, random deaths that have nothing to do with the fitness of their, of their genes to survive in that environment, but this is just the idea that things happen completely at random. The way we most commonly think about the effects of genetic drift is in terms of random sampling error that occurs when alleles combine together in this big gene pool to form genotypes. And so the simplest way to think about that is imagine you've got a big bowl of red and white jelly beans. You know you poured one bag of red jelly beans in and one bag of white. You mix them up really, really well. You know that they're 50% red and 50% white. So if you reached into that bowl and picked out just two jelly beans, it wouldn't surprise you very much if both of those two jelly beans turned out to be red. But if you reached in both hands and pulled out, say, a hundred jelly beans, and all of those hundred jelly beans were red, or all of them were white, that would be pretty surprising, right? You would not expect that. That would defy the laws of probability. More likely, you would get something closer to that 50-50 split between red and white jelly beans that's representative of the whole population in the bowl. So we can think about the same thing in terms of probabilities when we think of this gene pool. So first of all, let's think about a sperm and an egg forming a zygote. This is going back to your very basic genetics over here on this side of the screen. And we know that if you have two parents who are heterozygotes at a locus, so big A and little a, you would predict that if the sperm and eggs combined completely at random, you would have certain probabilities of getting these different genotypes, right? And just in the boxes in the Punnett square, you can see that there's a one out of four probability that you get big A, big A, two out of four or one half that you get big A and little a, and one fourth that you get little a, little a. But if these two parents only have two kids, they can't possibly be in those proportions, right? And even if they only had four kids, these are just probabilities. This is not deterministic. So each individual act of a sperm meeting an egg is a separate event with its own probability. And so you've got a greater likelihood of getting a heterozygote, but you're not going to get them in this exactly one to two to one relationship. Same concept applies if you think of this population level Punnett square over on the right side. So you've got a population, think of it as a big gene pool, it's randomly mixing. Okay, that's that Hardy-Weinberg condition that the population undergoes random mating. And you've got allele frequencies. So that gives rise to probabilities of getting um, zygotes with each of the genotypes of interest. So Again, if you've got, uh, this is the same Punnett square that we were looking at before with an allele frequency of big A of 0.6, an allele frequency of little a of 0.4, the probability of getting big A, big A because of the greater allele frequency of the big A alleles is 0.36. The probability of getting a heterozygote, big A, little a, is 48 out of these 100, and the probability of getting the little a, little a homozygote is 16. So 0.4 times 0.4. And this is where we get these probabilities. But remember, again, these are only probabilities. The smaller that sample size is, 
the less probable it is that the exact allele frequencies in the next generation are going to match up with those that are statistically likely given the starting allele frequencies. So in any population with finite number of individuals, there's always some possibility of some deviation from these expected genotype frequencies and allele frequencies in the next generation. What we're looking at here is a simulation of what happens under this random sampling error generation after generation. So in this case for 50 generations, each one of these lines represents a population, each of them starting at an allele frequency of 50%. So we plot only the frequency of one allele. If we have two alleles, then we know that the other allele is just one minus that. So as one goes up, the other one goes down. So each of these colored lines is a different population, completely separate simulation. And what we can see is that these allele frequencies deviate from the starting allele frequency at random. And what can happen over many generations is some of these drift quite a bit from those starting allele frequencies. So in relatively large population size, these are populations of 2,000, the effect is rather small over a small number of generations. You get kind of a spreading out of these populations away from the 50-50. Some of them end up with this particular allele at a lower frequency. Some of them end up with that allele at a higher frequency. But as we go to smaller population sizes, these effects are a lot more dramatic. Why? Because if you've got one additional copy of one allele in a smaller population, that represents a greater percentage of the total number of alleles in that population. It's going to have an exaggerated effect on that allele frequency. And so what we see in this population of 200 is that after 50 generations, you get some of them some of these populations with a very, very low frequency of this allele, some of them with very high. And when you go to very small population sizes, these fluctuations in allele frequencies are very dramatic to the point where in a very small number of generations, in the case of this yellow population, only 10, one of the alleles becomes fixed in the population. The other one is eliminated. In this uh, green population you see after about 10 generations, uh, the other allele becomes fixed, and this allele goes to extinction, but none of them stay at this 50% frequency. They drift all over the place at random in each generation. So the ultimate effect of genetic drift is always to reduce genetic variation in a population. It always results in what we call random fixation of alleles. We see it over here, completely at random. And in some populations, it can be this allele that we're tracking here that becomes fixed. In some populations, it can be another one. There's nothing different about these two populations. Remember, this is a computer simulation, so there's no selection. There's nothing else going on but these random sampling errors. And so there's no way to predict what the effects of genetic drift are going to be. It's completely random. We call this random fixation of alleles. Alleles are lost at a faster rate in smaller populations. And then the alternative allele becomes fixed. Again, random fixation of alleles. It takes a lot longer in this population of 200 for these allele frequencies to change dramatically. Um, eventually, over more generations, these lines will also go to the top and to the bottom, and one allele will become fixed. In much larger populations, it takes a, long, a longer time. But it's a mistake to think that genetic drift is only a factor in very small populations. To illustrate why this is true, let's think about playing a slot machine. So let's assume that the slot machine is fair. It's really giving random results. And you put in your quarters, and every once in a while you get a payout. And the number of quarters you have is going to fluctuate in some way. The number of quarters that you and the machine have to begin with is like the population size. The number of quarters you have is the frequency of one allele. The number of quarters in the machine is the frequency of the other allele. So in most cases, the machine's going to have many, many more quarters than you have. So you're going to start at a relatively low allele frequency and a finite population size. As you sit there and play, you're ultimately going to lose all of your money if you play long enough. But how long it will take will depend on how many quarters you start with. So we all know that if you go into play a slot machine with just one roll of quarters, you play for a certain amount of time, and you're going to run out of quarters. You come in with two rolls, you're going to play for longer, usually before you run out of quarters. So that's the usual situation. But let's, let's think about, now imagine 
that you and the slot machine both have a finite number of quarters, okay, and, and that they're going to be relatively even. So your quarters represent one allele, those the machine represent the other, and the game ends when one or the other of you run out. If it's truly random, either you or the machine has some probability of, of winning this game. There's a chance to win uh, if, the, if the machine has a number of quarters that's somewhere close to the number of quarters that you have. The probability of winning depends on how many quarters each of you starts with. So the game will take the longest if you and the slot machine begin with the same number of quarters, so allele frequencies are both 0.5, and if you both have a lot of quarters, so a very large population size. But no matter what that finite population size is, if you were to play infinitely long, if you had unlimited time to play, eventually one of you is going to end up with all the quarters. Either you'll have all the quarters or the machine will have all the quarters. The one allele is going to be fixed because the longer you play, the more drift is going to take place. It's going to gradually over many 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 rounds of this game just drift in one direction or the other and the ultimate result no matter what that population size is as long as it's finite is that one of those alleles is going to be fixed in the population. So let's relate this again more explicitly back to the case of uh, populations and allele frequencies. Because the fluctuations in allele frequency from one generation to the next are caused by random sampling error. Again, this effect is relatively small with large population sizes, relatively large with small population sizes. Every population is going to follow a unique evolutionary path. So think of the different lines in the graph of the simulation you saw a little while ago. Each one is going to have its own independent result. So each game, whether the machine wins or you win, it's going to be completely random, completely arbitrary. Genetic drift has a more rapid and dramatic effect on allele frequencies in small populations than in large populations. So the game is going to be over sooner if there are fewer quarters between you and the machine. Given sufficient time, genetic drift can produce substantial changes in allele frequencies, even in very large populations. So in the analogy of the slot machine, given infinite playing time, someone's going to run out of quarters, either you or the machine, no matter how many you start with. As long as it's a finite number, if you play long enough, those frequencies are going to drift away from the starting frequencies toward one side or the other. So if we think back again to these Hardy-Weinberg conditions, remember we said that really for all of these conditions to be exactly met is not possible in any population. It's not possible for any population to truly be infinitely large, right? There's always going to be a finite population size. But we also said that populations can be close enough to these conditions to essentially behave as if they're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so in the case of population size, we can now see why that's true. A very large population is going to be changing allele frequencies due to genetic drift at such a low rate. So if we think about the number of generations over which we would be looking for evolutionary change in very large populations, those changes due to genetic drift are going to be negligible. So we can say that that population is essentially in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So let's contrast the loss of genetic diversity due to genetic drift to the loss of genetic diversity due to natural selection. So in natural selection, the loss of allelic diversity is going to be limited to those loci that affect the fitness of organisms. It's only going to affect those. Because genetic drift is completely random with respect to fitness, genetic drift is going to cause the loss of genetic diversity across the entire genome. And so if we wanted to try to measure or quantify this overall loss of genetic variation due to genetic drift, we can use a quantity called heterozygosity. Heterozygosity is defined as the proportion of loci in the entire genome at which there's more than one allele in the population. So if you look at the entire genome, locus by locus, and, and see how many of those loci have more than one allele, and then divide by the total number of loci, 
that is the heterozygosity. So do not confuse this with another sense in which the word heterozygosity is sometimes used, being the percentage of individuals in a population that are heterozygous at a particular locus. So in that sense, you could say um, if heterozygotes are being selected for and you have more heterozygotes in the population than you would expect based on Hardy-Weinberg condition, you could say that that population has high heterozygosity. That's not the sense of the word that we're talking about when we talk about loss of genetic variation to genetic drift. It's this proportion of loci across the entire genome at which there is more than one allele in a population. And this number for heterozygosity, in theory, can range between zero and one. Zero would mean that every single locus in the genome in this population has only one allele. Unlikely, that's the extreme end of that, this is a continuum. So the lower that value, the lower the genetic diversity. One would mean that there's more than one allele at every single locus in the genome. Again, also highly unlikely, but the higher that number is toward one means that there is a large amount of allelic diversity in the population. So to wrap up, we can add genetic drift now to the list we've been building about the different factors that tend to decrease genetic variation. So we've seen that in any population with a finite population size, there's going to be, given enough time, random fixation of alleles. That time is shorter in smaller populations, longer in larger populations, but that is the ultimate fate of any uh, population undergoing genetic drift is that there's going to be some amount of random fixation of alleles. And so this is ultimately going to de decrease the allelic variation or the genetic variation in populations. And this is going to have a specific signature in the genome that's going to be distinct from loss of allelic diversity due to selection and that it's going to be rather uniform throughout the genome.